Hello, my name is Patrick Shaw, and I'm a partner and head of banking and finance of Mayor Brown in Frankfurt. On Wednesday, 24th of June, we held our sixth OTC Derivatives Seminar under the title Managing Crisis and Transition. Due to the Corona crisis, we held this seminar this year as a WebEx conference. This year, we offer you the opportunity to watch a recording of our seminar. The speakers during the seminar have been my partners Anna Pinedo from New York, Chris Arnold and Ed Parker from London, and myself, Patrick Shaw. The last part of this year's seminar dealt with Brexit for the fourth time in a row. And there's still a lot of uncertainty, as you can see in the following. Um, absolutely. Well, over to the uh, first uh, first slide. And you know, Patrick, it's not quite as uh, exciting for me as uh, back in 2016, we were um, giving a, one of the early uh, iterations of this conference. And I thought that we'd just be able to, to say a short aside saying, well, that was close. It was a vote to stay in uh, the, the EU. Our conference was two days after the vote. And I had to, uh, together with Chris, we gave an impromptu presentation to a a large German audience about, um, and we were very well received. They, they did let us uh, leave at the end of the session, uh, and we, we showed what we uh, we thought was likely uh, to happen. And this is a flashback to that slide, and actually that's more or less what the options options turned out to be. Uh, although of course um, there was Canada plus plus and various other ones that have uh, have been have been added. So it, where we've got to have been more towards the the, 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 the sort of Canada. Uh, agreement with a sort of a turbocharged version uh, is the intention, but we are not there by any means at all. So let's go to um, the next slide. In 2018, we um, um, added another Brexit session to our annual OTC conference in Frankfurt. I've got a, a picture there at the side of the screen. I'm giving the, the presentation uh, again, uh, and you can see the text that uh, accompanied that. Um, we, the Mayor Brown offices in Frankfurt are in the, the low 30s uh, floors of uh, one of the large towers. And at, at that point, um, our German clients were pointing out to me in the drinks after uh, that the, the area I should consider moving my family to in, in Frankfurt after uh, England, London shut up uh, business. Uh, but our discussion was all about the status of Brexit negotiations at the conference in uh, 2018. We'd had um, a provisional agreement of how much the UK owes the EU, EU um, really getting into the weeds of you know, what's happening with the northern uh, Irish border. Um, but the uh, negotiations are really sort of just starting uh, to get momentum. We uh, had had the vote on the Commons on the EU withdrawal bill uh, with you know, various uh, parts of that overturned, lots of uh, um, uh, lots of amendments at the House, uh, uh, lots of amendments at the House of Lords uh, level. Um, uh, and then, um, as those listening may remember, the UK government originally intended for the UK to leave the EU on 29th March 2019, but then that was postponed um, several times uh, as um, the uh, agreements with the European Council were made to extend the Article 50 period. So on to the next slide. Uh, last year, and this is still very relevant, we were talking about what were the, uh, at the conference in Frankfurt, we were talking about what are the further English law issues. So here's our slide there, and you can see what was standing out. We were in the middle of the Conservative leadership election uh, at, at the time. The uh, issues to do with the Northern Irish border were, were hot, hotting up. But um, ISDA had released um, some no-deal amendments that could be added to ISDA documentation. They covered confidentiality waivers, the um, EMEA PDD protocol, uh, margin documentation, contractual recognition of bail-in and resolution stays. Uh, and um, we, we also covered governing law and choice of law issues. And m many of these are still uh, very much live issues. So I'll turn on to the next, uh, this uh, slide um, just brought up um, here. Fast forward, where are we in 2020? Of course, the UK left the EU at uh, uh, 11 p.m. UK time on the 31st January. So that means the UK is no longer an EU member state. And the UK-EU withdrawal agreement came into force uh, on that day, exit day, um, following the various ratifications that had to be carried out. And we're now in the post-Brexit uh, transition period. 
Um, and uh, we uh, started on exit day, and it's going to uh, run until the end of this year, 31st December 2020, unless that is extended. And during that period, the UK continues to be treated for most purposes as if it's an EU member state. But there's going to be significant change at the end of the transition period, even if a comprehensive future UK-EU relationship can be concluded and we don't get a no-deal cliff-edge uh, Brexit. Um, and uh, during uh, some key points um, uh, for us to, um, to note is on 15th of June, the UK government said um, that they will not be requesting any extension to the transition period. Well, never say never. Um, there's not a very good track record of um, following these lines in the sands and deadlines. So entirely possible that that period uh, could be extended. Um, I've rather missed seeing Brexit in the news, seeing uh, the last few months when it's been all about COVID, but it's uh, creeping back in again. Um, and some key points just to consider about the transition peri period. These are um, uh, transitional arrangements only until the with this withdrawal period ends. At that point, a new body of EU law is created in, uh, created in, in, in the UK. Um, and we're going to see um, significant efforts to make various agreements with the EU for a lasting relationship afterwards. And, and an example of that is a statement uh, that uh, was con very recently uh, confirmed uh, that the UK will be creating legislation to bring into U UK law the remaining EMIR refit requirements that will apply in the EU after the transition uh, period. Uh, and I think we can expect to see similar things taking place with initial margin when those changes are made. So this intention to keep, carry on uh, alignment in key parts with, uh, with, with, with the EU law. Um, if I just move to the next, uh, next slide. There are various you new know, live issues that market participants need to be up, up, up to date with. For example, will we see a, a breach of um, is the master agreement events of default? For example, a breach of representation that there's no conflict with applicable law, or that there's a breach of agreement as a result of a failure to maintain authorizations under Section 4B of the is the master agreement, or failure to comply with law uh, pursuant to Section 4C if the UK loses, uh, uh, loses access uh, uh, for financial service firms to EU financial markets. There's a very good ISDA FAQ on the ISDA site on all of these points. Uh, the market view is that these would not be uh, events, uh, events of default. Um, there also is a choice of law uh, provisions. Again, these are regularly updated on, on, on the ISDA site. Uh, but Looking at the uh, recast regulation, a huge topic in itself. I'll just limit uh, myself to saying that that uh, regulation bounds EU courts to respect jurisdiction clauses in favor of other UK courts on the basis of Brussels recast one regulation. And that the withdrawal agreement provides that in the UK, as well as in the member states and situations involving the UK, Brussels recast regulation continues to apply to judgments given in legal proceedings instituted before the end of the transition period. Uh, and hopefully we see that um, that continue uh, afterwards. So um, I think the last slide I have here, as a result of those uncertainties about governing law, we um, uh, saw a French version of the ISDA master agreement come in uh, and an Irish ISDA law uh, version of the master agreement come in. Um, the problem with the French law version is it's one thing to have a French law master agreement, but you've got thousands and thousands of pages of other documents which would need to be half in French and half in English. So if you think about the 600 pages of the commodity definitions, the 250 pages of the credit derivative definitions, um, the new 2020 definitions, it's very hard to make that workable. Much easier for the Irish is the master agreement, but there seems to be little appetite in Ireland for pushing that forward. So whereas this was a hot topic last year, certainly when I've been talking into the market, in the market, I haven't seen anybody really taking this seriously outside of uh, um, France itself for domestic transactions. So I think there the real casualty might be the French FBF uh, agreement. 
But of course, there is always an element of watch this space uh, should they, we have a no deal uh, looking, looking more likely. Uh, so with that, um, I um, will just uh, move to a thought to the, my last slide very quickly. Um, and uh, it's really um, something that's quite uh, prescient uh, from back in 2011 that was released uh, by, the, by the views of the HM Treasury and the UK's uh, former uh, financial services or, or authority, and they expressed their views uh, uh, in a joint response to the EU's um, for, for, uh, regulator, which is now ESMA, on a review of, uh, of MIFID I. And in response to Caesar's question to EU member states as to whether it be necessary to introduce a third country regime in MIFID based on the principle of exemptive relief for equivalent jurisdictions, the FSA and HM uh, Treasury uh, said that such a regime would potentially undermine the principle of open markets, would be protectionist, and could involve very significant time and effort as regulatory systems are compared across relevant countries. So quite interesting that that's now uh, entirely the, um, something different that's being proposed as part of Brexit. But uh, that's with the benefit of hindsight and that, with that food uh, for, for thought. Uh, I hand across to, uh, um, I think, to Chris, is that right? Or to Patrick. I think to me, as Lenny thinks, um, a final word on, on the new perspective for, from, from Germany. Um, what, we, what, we currently, what we currently see and what we heard yesterday, that the EU, EU is still pessimistic about equivalence, not knowing how, how the UK would diverge from European regulation post-Brexit, makes us a bit nervous. Here, um, we have to, we, we thought that uh, giving the initial no deal scenario, uh, we had a couple of governmental actions here in, in Germany, on, and in particular there was a change to the German Banking Act that enabled uh, BaFin to issue a, a general decree to enable um, to enable doing business based on previous uh, pa previous um, passportings and and previous licensings at least for for uh, for legacy transactions and some related transactions there too. But this, this uh, governmental uh, law, uh, this change in law related to the no deal scenario without, without, a, with, without a withdrawal agreement. Yeah? As there is now a withdrawal agreement, the position is no longer so clear and prepared than it was in, in with respect, respect to the initial no Brexit scenario. So um, Given that, given that we have currently a lot of focuses on COVID-19 here in Germany, we need to also focus on, on Brexit going forward as, as there's no clear solution at this point in time if there would finally be a leave without a further arrangement between, between the EU and, and the UK after this transition period. So we need, really need to closely monitor that and I'm not really um, uh, I'm not, it's not really clear that we need another governmental action here by a change in laws if, if, it, comes, if it comes clear that there will be no uh, agreement between the UK and the EU with regard to, for example, passporting rights as of 1st January 2021. So um, we, will, we have to monitor that. It's, nothing, it's really not clear, and there are a lot of risks still going on with regard to UK EU trading relationships, and, and this also applies to clearing. Yeah, we also have to mention that because lots of many of the German market clear via also UK CCPs. So the position remains still unclear in terms of equivalence decisions, and 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 um, and maintaining clearing relationships with the UK. So it's, it's, it's an important topic. Um, we, we, we will monitor this and we'll inform for sure our clients if, 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 if this becomes more clearer what would what be the political uh, compromise and our agreement. With that, um, uh, we are done with our slides for today with our first and I hope only digital <laughs> uh, OTC seminar. Yeah, I hope that we can meet in person next year at, um, in our offices. Um, I'm, I'm thankful that, that many of you um, joined us in, in making this test yeah, to do such kind of a seminar on, on a WebEx ba basis. Um, I think we find, uh, we find a good solution today um, and we'll think about what what, what, what are the consequences of these kind of WebEx um, seminars? 
Um, in any event, I'm, I'm thankful for my partners, and I already have to leave Chris and Ed for, for joining today, preparing the slides. Thank you very much, and our IT colleagues that really helped us a lot in, in setting this up. Um, so um, if there are further questions after the seminar, please send us an email. Thank you very much for joining, and please stay healthy and safe. And uh, see you next time here in our Frankfurt office in 2021, hopefully. Thank you.